Welcome back to the Saving Science video series where we attempt to answer the question, does academic science need to be saved? And to answer the question, we tell stories. So just a brief recap of last time, we looked at the academic system in which most scientists work and briefly generally a researcher will work at a university and then get grants to get resources to do the research and then with those combined resources you conduct the research and hopefully find something interesting which you then have to sell to a journal and ferociously competitively out with other academics into publishing in the best journal and then that gets you personal and professional awards which gives you promotions uh, larger grants and then more uh, resources to publish even more high tech cutting edge research that gets accepted in potentially a even more glamorous journals to the point where you might be uh, winning awards and distinguished academic career awards from professional societies which further boost your ego and this can become a a, a vicious cycle uh, some would call it a race to the bottom as academics try to outcompete each other and therefore are getting closer and closer to the edge of unethicality, I guess, the very gray zone. But we'll get back to that. Um, and so last time, feeling better now, uh, we covered the key player, the individual researcher, and we basically went over the fact that humans are biased in many different ways and they will always be biased which is why the scientific method was invented in the first place so we have cognitive biases emotional biases political ideological biases and then on top of that we have a big ego and then we have ego protection and this is all fine uh actually but these days, uh, the personal and professional rewards have probably never been larger. And so um, status, outside financial interests, best-selling books, uh, media attention. I mean, there's never been more media attention on scientists with uh, the mainstream media becoming more interested in science, popular science, and then the new media and the social media uh, and so it's a combination of the classic human biases and the new reality of heightened heightened rewards and highest stake science and so it's the perfect storm for bad research unfortunately um, and so it's never been more important to get back to basics, the scientific basics, which are transparency and replication. Uh, and so today we will continue telling stories and we will shift towards universities. And so most academics work at a university, either publicly funded university or private private universities, though most vast majority work at public universities, which uh, will matter, which does matter, and and we mentioned last time, of course, the publisher perish problem. But 
it's uh, way more complicated and way more way more nuanced rather and so to start a story in grad school professors would have meetings of course many meetings way too many meetings that's another story um and in this particular meeting our advisor was criticized for having expectations that were too high about graduate student publications so typically in academia you if you want to be competitive for professor jobs you have to publish papers during your phd so this was not always the case so again it's another example where academia has gotten worse over time because of hyper competition because even even a few generations ago uh PhD students could still be competitive for professor jobs even with only maybe one working paper meaning meaning paper in preparation and your dissertation which is one long paper and um over time things just got more competitive and then you needed two or three publications and now you it be closer in depending on the domain but in social psychology uh, not unheard of to have 15 to 25 publications by the end of your PhD. I mean, th this is the real number. <laughs> so there was kind of this conflict in the department where there was younger professors like our advisor who were more in tune with the reality, the hyper-competitive reality, who were saying, no, no, we really need to push our grad students to aim for let's say six to eight publications and that can include co-author publications where you're not the first author and we'll get back to that and the older professors were really against that and said no 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 we don't want this be we don't want to play that game we don't want to put that much pressure on the grad students and and he was just saying, yeah, but it's the reality. So maybe it's unfortunate, but it's the reality. And we, if we want our PhD students to go on and, and continue achieving and being successful, they need to have good targets. And so in this case, he admittedly, he should be given credit here because he was, he was being rational to push us to be competitive right but but unfortunately it's 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 still very problematic because again grad school should be first and foremost about exploring your curiosity and being trained to do science correctly of course, you need to learn how to publish, but that's more of an epiphenomenon. It's more of a secondary thing, right? Because if you don't do science correctly, if you don't do your research correctly and rigorously, then you, then you have nothing to disseminate. You have nothing that needs to be reported. So it kind of gets the cart in front of the horse. But at least he was trying to help us, in a sense. And um, so, and so it was interesting to see that there was conflict between generations, and this is something we'll return to, where when things started going south. Different researchers had very different reactions to what was going on and, and, and how serious the problems were and still are, really. And that's because they lived, they went through academia in different times and there was different forces and different levels of competition. 
And um, because over time, it's, again, because most universities are publicly funded, it was both an increase in numbers of grad students graduating, but also a decrease in funding and a decrease in the number of professor positions available. So again, kind of a perfect storm for things becoming so competitive and the rewards getting higher that you know, if you want to succeed, you have to be very comfortable at the edge, at this dark edge of ambiguous or questionable research practices where you, you, you just want your results to be a little bit more polished, a little bit more compelling, and, and you'll do what it takes to convince an editor to publish your paper. So, and so that's part of misaligned incentives. So the incentive structure in the university, both for grad students and professors, are inconsistent with just the fundamental basics of science. Again, the scientific method you we all learned in high school. Um, and so the next story is actually I can introduce it in terms of another suboptimality of universities, <clears throat> which is that over time they became more bureaucratic and more corporatized with a growing administration staff who are dedicated to administration and operation of the university who don't necessarily have academic backgrounds. So for example, MBAs and other business type people. And, and the bureaucracy is, is just unfathomable. Um, and but I should clarify that the corporate the corporatization of universities is not necessarily a bad thing if it means operating more efficiently. But if they're hiring admin and senior executive business types who don't have an academic background, of course, it's easier for you, the university to start straying from its mission, which is, of course, higher learning and scholarship and research, right? I mean, those, those are the main things. It should not be about brand and making money, uh, or even student experience and all this other stuff is also questionable. Um, so, and part of this corporatization came other issues which would fall under ideological biases. Though it's also possible that it came from within the academia and then spread to the corporate world and then kind of came back. <laughs> and so, and as I mentioned last time, most academics are more left-leaning, meaning socially progressive, but in some places, it, it's gotten so radical that these social progressive policies have become illiberal, I mean, inconsistent with classical liberal values, such as J.S. Mill and the elevation of the individuals. For in, so for instance, part of this radical social uh, progressive values is the elevation of groups over and above individuals. So group performance becomes more important than 
individuals and meritocracy, right? And again, these stories are going to be surreal to a general audience. And this is, have been my experience and the experience of others. When we tell these stories to everyday people, like your barber, your plumber, your accountant, they don't believe these stories. Because um, how can you have academic science without meritocracy? Meaning uh, the most competent, the most intelligent individuals should be getting positions and getting grants, getting jobs. But according to this social justice perspective, or I should say radical social justice, I mean, there's nothing wrong with social justice and, and having a fair world. But when it gets too radical, and, and, and again, you're contradicting basic civil liberties and individual freedoms classic classical liberalism that's when things become problematic um and so for instance uh, harvard university <laughs> is being sued by asians because they have allegedly discriminated against Asians in hiring, not hiring, in admissions standards. So applying to get into Harvard at the undergraduate and graduate level, basically Asians have to score much higher on the SAT to be able to get in. And, and recently, I think they did manage to avoid litigation or the, the cases something happened where they they managed to avoid the worst but it's still ongoing I believe and um, and so that I mean that's just an example where they can't really defend it other than saying well we we want a diverse campus and so because and 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 so if they somehow didn't have these discriminatory practices there'd be too many Asians on campus i mean it's it, but if you talk to these people you know they have this vague language that makes it sound less terrible but again all of that is just complete nonsense <laughs> with all due respect because Again, we have to judge people on the content of their character, not on their skin color or genitalia between their legs. I mean, it's 2020, and there's still so much time and emotion wasted trying to make sure groups are equal and trying to make sure uh, there's social justice and equity, and it's it's mostly not working and or making things worse. And even just talking about this is making me very uncomfortable, which is again, even worse, where my position is, you know, I don't have all the answers and I try to avoid politics in general because it's just, it's just taken over everything. So I avoid politics. I just want to discuss ideas. How come we're not often not even allowed to discuss these ideas? on university campuses. And, um, but it's the reality. And again, Heterodox Academy are doing great work in posting content and resources. They've actually republished a, a more modern accessible version of J.S. Mills on Liberty, which is very good, just to reinforce the enlightenment values that, that got us so far and led to uh, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, all the technology we take for granted is based on enlightenment values of democracy, meritocracy, critical reason, scientific evidence. Uh, and we're, we're straying from that path 
we're we're regressing towards a more barbaric tribal and sometimes violent some of these radical social justice individuals will resort to violence if you don't agree with their core beliefs so it's it's kind of a cult actually it's a, it's a religion where if you challenge their beliefs and you have good arguments they can't counter argue with facts or reason so they get emotionally upset and they try to intimidate you emotionally and or threaten violence and antifa is part of that group where they'll use violence in the name of social justice well <laughs> you know you've gone too far if that's where you're operating so and it's just a few other quick examples there was a case Oh, there's an even case in Canada at the University of British Columbia where in the advertisement for a professor job in psychology, and again, they, they're very careful with their language, but in the job ad, they basically say, said, we're only going to consider individuals from uh, marginalized groups. And because usually they'll say, well, we have a, preference for certain individuals from certain groups but here it was basically saying you know if if basically if you're a man there's there's no there's no point in applying and quickly on twitter people said well how is this even consistent with labor labor laws we already have labor laws to protect individuals from being discriminated against and again, somehow they, they have good lawyers. They have a lot of money. So they just use language. They, they, they have workarounds, kind of like the Harvard case. They have workarounds where they're saying, no, no, we don't use quota. We use the subjective personality assessments. Right? So then you can easily just say, well, I guess the Asians don't have good personality or something. And, but... A better example is in the Netherlands at uh, Eindhoven University or Technical University. And they went even further. We're in the job ad. They said only, so this is for a professor position in, they have a different structure, but it, it's like human interaction or interdisciplinary departments. But in the job ad, it literally said, only women are allowed to apply for the six months, for the first six months. And if it's still not filled, then men can apply. Like this, this is a real thing. And again, you know, I would lean towards being against that uh, based on principles. Again, classic liberal principles, not because of my own sex. And, but at least we should be able to discuss this. So, so the story is, or the side story is that there was a professor, a male professor, though again, that shouldn't matter, from another university in the Netherlands who was organizing, he organized or co-organized a conference on how to improve psychological science. And they were discussing this at lunch and he voiced the opinion just saying, well, he, he not sure it's a good idea. And immediately they attacked him and then he got reported for violating the code of conduct and was more or less kind of removed from his own conference, <laughs> right? So again, and it goes on and on and on. I, I really want to move on, but it, it has to be mentioned. Uh, how is this possible that just voicing your opinion about something would get you in trouble. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's complete. Again, the university system and academia more generally should be the last place where you're censoring speech and censoring ideas, right? Okay, maybe corporate world. Yeah, it's a private company. They can do what they want. But this is university and it's publicly funded. You know, we have to stimulate and encourage, cultivate, 
critical reasoning and constructive debates. Uh, some call it adversarial collaborations or adversarial disagreements. And again, this this is how ideas progress, and this is how to make sure you, your ideas aren't bad, is to have a free market place where people exchange ideas and then the ideas there's a collision of ideas and the stronger ideas uh, remain intact and the weak ideas are buried in a sense and and again some of these ideolo ideologies and and there's there's probably not much credible evidence on this because it, it's naturally occurring but but there's some arguing that by trying to censor speech, you actually can increase extreme thinking and polarized thinking where uh, it could lead to a revival of bad ideas like white supremacy, right? And so again, the university Though, of course, we should all be civil and, and that, you know, that's just common sense that we all try to be nice and civil to each other. Um, but beyond just social norms of being nice and try not to be an asshole, any and all ideas should be freely discussed on a university campus and in a public square, really, a public park, public street, because uh, we already have hate speech laws and death threats, I mean, of course, those are completely unambiguously, well, hate speech laws can get hairy. But, you know, we already have enough laws protecting individuals. We're, we're, the Western countries, countries based on Western values, have the most freedom and people are the most protected. We don't need more laws. Uh, the laws can always be improved. But we shouldn't try to legislate speech. You cannot think clearly if you are worried about going to prison for what you're saying. And as you can tell, even just trying to explain this is very difficult for me because I'm already trying to think of the backlash. And I have other stories, but I want to move on. Um, so... So now we're around 2009, and I'm growing increasingly concerned about research methodology. Um, and we, other grad students, a few other grad students also were getting concerned. We formed a group called Critical Methodology, where we would just once a week meet and discuss a specific problem that we thought was important. I can go back to here, maybe. And then, then we would discuss what can we do to improve the situation. So we'd discuss issues like, well, the sample sizes seem too low. We, we're not collecting enough participants to detect meaningful effects, which would, in statistics, mean you don't have enough power. So your instruments aren't powerful enough to detect anything. And other issues. And and again, we were we were really motivated to figure this out. And in part, we formed the group because the professors they they seem they didn't seem as interested as we thought they should be. Though they would say, "Oh yeah, you know, it's good to have good methods," but they were kind of lukewarm or ambivalent. But then we started getting kind of ridiculed for being perfectionists and wanting scientific utopia and, and we were so idealist because we wanted higher standards. And, uh, and that got even weirder, right? Because the problems were objectively problems. And... Why would we, why would we just invent problems? And again, this is in the context of having most of your studies not working out. And we were doing 
individually 10, 15 studies per year. And most of them were not working. And, and then if something worked, then you tried to replicate it and it wouldn't work in the replication. Right? So it wasn't just that we were doing the right thing, but yet we were being socially mocked for trying to improve the situation. And, and then, yeah, some of these individuals were getting ahead. They were still publishing papers. And we started thinking, hmm, so people, grad students who are comfortable with lower research standards, they seem to be doing better. And they also seem not to be too enthusiastic about our group. So we just kept going because for us, we just couldn't let it go. I mean, when, when something doesn't make sense, you have to try to improve it. But we realized that the, the more time we spent trying to improve standards, the less time we were having to publish papers and, and, and get ahead in terms of our career. But for me, you know, I, I signed up to do real science and, and how could I get up in the morning to go do pseudoscience or what I soon learned? Yeah, at about this time, I started emailing professors who had published methods, papers, and seemed more rigorous. And then at conferences, I would meet them and they would also... He's saying, wow, yeah, we're really concerned. Like, this is not good. And it seems to be getting worse. When you read journals, the most prestigious journals, you could kind of see over time that the publications were getting kind of sexier and the data seemed, excuse me, even kind of just too good to be true. And one of these professors at Michigan State University in particular he turned me on to Richard Feynman and his essay, which was trans transformed from his uh, commencement speech called Cargo Cult Open Science. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go through it, it it's, uh, but it's worth reading, Cargo Cult Science. And it's Richard Feynman was a physicist who... Um, made major contributions uh, to quantum mechanics and uh, many other topics. And, but during his PhD, he was having debates with psychologists at the lunchroom where he was saying, ah, I don't think psychology is a real science. They don't seem to care about replication enough, for instance. Um, and he also admitted that psychology in, in some ways was more difficult, more challenging than physics, yet their standards were lower. And, oh, and he also suspected other challenges, which we'll get to, uh, which is known as heterogeneity, heterogeneity across individuals and uh, so he likened psychology as a field to a cargo cult science which was just this tribe during world war ii where the u.s were just offloading cargo to reduce weight because they were running out of fuel uh this tribe they they liked the free gifts and all the cargo, so they started setting up other makeshift air, air fields so that more planes would land. And of course, planes never landed, so everything looked like a real airport, but planes didn't land. And so Feynman used the metaphor for psychology, where well, everything looks like science. They have journals, they have conferences. <laughs> <coughs> But there's no real progress. And it's a bold claim. And um, so it, it got me interested, like, hmm, how could this be? And it did definitely seem consistent with a lot of the problems I was seeing in terms of 
lack of interest in replication or insufficient interest in replication. And we'll get back to even what, how I noticed pros were bending the, the definition of replication in favorable ways. So, um, so, so yeah, we became increasingly concerned, but it, this was pre Twitter, pre social media days, right? I mean, there was blogs, but they were not that popular. And so we, we were pretty powerless, right? We'd complain about it in private at the conference bar at the water cooler. Basically it was water cooler discussions and we were powerless. But then one day in 2010, everything changed and everything changed forever. And, and so what happened is, and I might've alluded to it, Daryl Bem, a professor of psychology at Cornell university, well-respected, and this is important, social psychologist who made several major theoretical contributions in uh, attitude research, cognitive dissonance, and even uh, sexual orientation development. And so he showed, I could actually maybe sh actually show the paper. So he got interested in the paranormal. So this is extra, sometimes known as extrasensory perception, ESP. And he managed to publish a paper reporting nine studies supporting the existence of ESP. And managed to get, get it published in the top journal in social psychology called the journal uh, JPSB, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And we, we got inside or, or inside scoop early access to this because our advisor just happened to be the editor, the action editor, right? Remember, uh, peer review involves an editor at the journal handling the paper and then finding three or four expert reviewers to handle, to, to review the paper and then they decide whether they accept it or reject it or need revisions. And so just by chance, so here's the paper. Mm. Let's go full screen. No, sorry. So this paper, probably will turn out to be one of the most important papers published in the history of modern science, at least for centuries. And I guess the high level summary is that the results are so shocking because he showed, he allegedly showed that humans could predict the future, could see into the future. So that's called precognition or premonition, right? When you, you have this sensation that, that you just anticipated something. But there's no way you could have done that using your own sensory systems, like your five, their normal five senses, right? And, but he followed all the accepted standards. And so the journal was put in a very difficult situation where they couldn't really reject it based on the evidence, the standards of evidence, the methodological standards. But but the topic and the results definitely seemed uh, unreal. 
And so they were literally stuck between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, if they accept it or if you believe it, you have to accept that humans can see into the future, which seems problematic for casinos, for stock markets, for the laws of physics. Uh, so that's very difficult to swallow. But, but, but on the other hand, you would have to conclude that all of the psychology is unreliable because he arrived at those results using the accepted standards, assuming he didn't com commit fraud. I mean, that was the only other possibility, right? And so, so there was, it was really a, a panic. People were panicking and people were upset. Uh, we were mocked in the media, even like mainstream media, BBC News, uh, CBC in Canada. People were emailing me, literally saying, what is happening in psychology? How can this professor have arrived at these results? And there's a, there's a nice table here. Curiously, there's no charts. There's no figures showing data patterns. But he did nine studies. And, well, we'll come back to this article. I mean, I could talk for two hours only on this topic. So you'll see he looked at kind of four different, four different uh, versions of what he called psi, psi as the more general ESP phenomena. But then there's different ways to observe it, such as um, the precognitive detection of erotic stimuli. Oh yeah, and this blew up so much, he ended up on the Colbert Colbert report, if you can find it, it's really funny because Daryl Bam is actually used to be a magician, which is part of the story. <laughs> and, and so in the first study, this is what he showed. Participants had to sit in front of a computer and there was two curtains, A and B. And their job, their task simply was predict behind which curtain a picture will appear and they had to press A or B, left or right. And some of the pictures were erotic, some were not. And on average, across 100 participants, it, the average guess, guessing rate was 53.1%. And so Colbert called that pornception because it's like perception of porn, pornception, because it, it, it only seemed to work for pornographic stimuli. Though he didn't pre-specify that, which we'll come back to because this is important. Because um, if you had all kinds of stimuli and then you only look at the stimuli that gave you the result you wanted, then that's... A problem. So, so that's Bam's bomb, and that was September 2010. And again, there was panic, people were upset, but it was really exciting because now there was rumors of what's going to happen. There's rumors that this lab, a few labs are already orchestrating replications, and there's other rumors of some other big methods papers that are going to come out saying we need to raise standards. So it was an exciting time because it felt like we were doing science again, where we we're actually going to look at replication evidence to see, okay, is there something there? Oh, and very briefly, <laughs> the other surreal, completely mind-blowing thing that happened is the next lab meeting. So commonly, a professor will have a lab meeting once a week to review how to design the next study or, or actually present new results. 
or practice job talks. And so the first lab meeting after the publication of this paper, our professor was telling us about, because again, he was the editor, editor. Though I think in the case, there was also, he was action editor and then the editor, editor kind of uh, helped given this, they knew this was kind of a special situation right away. And he started the lab meeting by saying that these results might challenge the laws of physics and that physicists might have to reconsider cause and effect and how effects might precede cause, right? And, and me and, and uh, my office mate, we were sitting in the back saying, like, what has the director kind of lost his mind? I mean, <laughs> but, but again, if you can't find fatal flaws of the paper, it's actually rational. To say, well, I must believe this, these findings, right? Oh, I could, I could go down and show the results, but again, this is for a general audience, but um, some of you might like to look at these. So yeah, there's so much to talk about, but... Um, oh, and then just the title. So the title is Feeling the Future, because premonition, when you, you feel... You know, it's like when you're looking at the... Jesus, the telephone, here. And so you're looking at your phone and then all of a sudden it rings. And you think, oh, I think I kind of felt that. I felt that coming, right? That's premonition. Um, so yeah, you don't have to look at this, but it, this shows you, um, oh, but again, it doesn't show the sample sizes. It only shows you the p-value and, and the effect size. And the effect size in science is, is the size of the signal. Because again, it's not just about discovering something, but you have to quantify how large a signal did you observe. Is it very large? Is it medium? Is it small? And in these cases, these are pretty small effects. Um, and so even if they would replicate, they'd be more vulnerable to being artifacts, maybe just measurement artifacts or other instrument artifacts. And right, the paper was called Feeling the Future, Evidence for Precognition, and so on. But immediately, well, first of all, uh, when I heard the news it was going to be published and we were at a restaurant where the director first told us this because the postdoc was visiting, whatever. I immediately started writing a paper in my head about how this tells us that the research standards in psychology are way too low and fatally flawed. And, it, and of course, we were excited even for personal reasons because, because this vindicated our growing concern that the research standards were too low and we had been mocked. So all of a sudden, we go from being mocked to, wow, you guys like, predicted this. So it's ironic that we predicted that this would happen. And it's a paper about predicting the future. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's true and false. And then we were able to predict the future future of how these effects won't replicate and how if we do look at if we start taking replication more seriously and we start looking at standards, we're going to find some bad news. Um, and so we wrote a paper called Fearing the Future of Psychology's Fatal Flaws with you know, Modal Research Practices. And so again, and then we were right. So then over the last 10 years, and so again, this is why 2020 video series is, is a good time to reflect because it's been 10 years since this critical crisis inducing event. And you can see how much have the standards in academia changed or psychology specifically, but what we quickly learned that these problems were widespread in virtually any field you look, you find problems. And systemic problems, of course, there's always going to be 
bad research somewhere. But when the leading research published at the leading journals by the leading researchers uh, are consistently not replicating or problems with the data or even insufficient transparency, then, th th then that's a serious problem. Um, okay, how are we doing with time? So that's Daryl Bem's bomb. And um, feeling the future, but then we wrote the um, fearing the future. So, so that was 2010, and again, it was very exciting because you know, I would wake up in the morning and and it would feel like science again because it, it was it was like something was on the line. Rather than just, oh, everything is true. And you look at the journal and it's always the same researchers publishing the same things and everything works. So, because back then it was, okay, it's published, so I have to believe it. It's published in the best journals. So you have to believe it. So you have to believe everything. You know what I mean? Like there was not, and you, and you were trying to be skeptical, but it was kind of a faux skepticism. It was kind of like, you have to show you're skeptical enough, but not so skeptical that you're perceived as a difficult person. Oh, I was told that all the time. Be sure you're not perceived as a difficult person. Okay. But if there's bad research everywhere, and I'm just trying to point it out, how could I do that? positively oh yeah i was also told you should try to be a more positive person <laughs> yeah but what happens if everything is negative and i'm just trying to tell the truth right and i'm bending over backwards to find the positive actually even part of this video series i have a note to remind myself to bend over backwards to find the positives because it's there's definitely some characteristics of academia that are positive for example that there's a lot of smart people, or a lot of high achieving, motivated, intelligent, extremely intelligent people among the most intelligent I've ever met. Um, and a lot of them are really hardworking. They're, they're workaholics that take their work very seriously. And a lot of them are very organized and have high standards in other ways so there was a lot of positive and um but it turns out it's it's possible there was more problems than than uh more things going wrong than things going right let's put it that way so psychology was still oh yeah and the, the media coverage just continued for weeks and weeks and weeks and months and well then there was a lot of speculation of was this a hoax and that, you know a, a big time stats professor when I told him that was his first reaction this other prof as well he said no 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 this is a hoax and it would make sense because he's a magician he used to be a magician who are expert at deceiving the audience using smoke and mirrors um, and but in interviews he was adamant that it was not a hoax and I had an email exchange with him we'll get back to that where he also reiterated no 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 this is not a hoax why would I want to embarrass my field um, and kind of tarnish his reputation. And, and so we're still kind of digesting the shockwaves of this bomb. And a few months later, 
another huge news occurred, which was the fraud case of Diederik Stapel from the Netherlands, which still is among the top three worst fraud cases in the history of science or modern science, um, where he, in the end, it was confirmed or discovered that he had committed fraud in uh, about 60 papers across almost 20 years. And uh, I think he published about 110 papers. So in more than half, he committed fraud by making up the data altogether or collecting the data but then just changing some of the numbers, which is called uh, falsification. So fabrication is you're just making stuff up. <laughs> Falsification, you actually do the study, but then you um, you change a few numbers. Um, and we'll come back to the psychology of fraud versus soft fraud versus questionable research practices. The very, very fuzzy boundaries. And so this was could have not come at a worse time because then because now people were like, whoa, what's really going on in the academia? In the academy. And all kinds of questions also arose. Because again, when you publish a paper, you almost always have a co-author. And so one of the first questions that arose was, well, how could he, how come no one noticed for that long? And how come peer reviewers didn't notice this? How come his co-authors didn't notice this? How come his students didn't notice this? His university? Never mind the funder. And so then an investigation was official investigation was started by the university by a group of statisticians who went through each one of his papers and interviewed most of his co-authors and they did a really good job and and actually to this day I think it's one of the best fraud investigation of all time that other universities need to follow suit and um, this is not the case in North America. For whatever reason, Netherlands, uh, well, maybe it's just a part of the culture, a bit more of an intellectual culture where scholarship and higher learning is, is really valued. And um, But we'll get back to these new standards of fraud, fraud investigation because in many cases, unfortunately, the university doesn't just not cooperate. They actively interfere with fraud cases, including one at my very own alma mater, Western University. Um, but we'll get back to that, um, which got very dark because it's in heart disease research. That's going to give me a heart attack. That heart disease researchers are committing fraud in their research to try to solve how to solve heart attacks. <laughs> so, and Stapel, well, I mean, he was interviewed and, and, and he then wrote a book which is also controversial. But he described when people say, well, how could you do this? I mean, how, you know, this is grotesque. This is really disgusting. I mean, 
and, and fraud is disgusting. It's it's really one of the worst things that that, that you can do. Um, because you know, it's science, it's it's based on trust, but verifying. But there has to be some trust that that you have the highest integrity. And and if you violate that trust, I mean, there there can there can be almost no second chance. And um, and his defense was well, the ecosystem, the, the environment, and we're social psychologists, so this is was even kind of more interesting because the social psychologists. Of course, for him, it's it's self-serving to say, well, I committed my fraud because of the potent social forces that was impinging on my behavior, like the publisher parish pressure and, and the, the pressure to be published in prestigious journals and the pressure to get media attention for your university and, and for your... Uh, Bean counting administrators, and but in his book and later interviews, he also did mention. Well, it 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 it, it kind of was a perfect storm where the stakes got really high, and his perceived chance of getting caught is very low. And he used an analogy in his book, I think called Derailed Science. Um, though it was written in Dutch and then was translated by Nick Brown in English. And it's actually free. Though initially people were boycotting the book and, and spreading it on on peer-to-peer. -peer, which is, you know, it's because it's it's worse enough you commit fraud at that level embarrassing an entire field and now you're going to try to make money off your story but for me i just saw it more well we need to know more about at least his account of how this happened so of course he's he's gonna probably lie and you you, you can't trust his account but but when you hear him describe the situation, right, there, there was grains of truth or grains of merit in some of his arguments that the external environment in which academics operate is extremely dysfunctional. And he used the metaphor of a cookie jar without a lid, right, where he just couldn't resist. He, his ego was growing and other people were getting the large conference rooms and other people were getting splashy science publications, science the most considered the most prestigious journal across all areas of science. It's just called science, <laughs> though it's now known as uh, it's just a glam journal that, I mean, they have changed some journal policies to improve the standards, but it, it's mostly negligible um so he kind of implied that he wished there was at least a lid on the cookie jar i mean there is no lid you just i feel like another splashy publication and i can just change a few numbers no one's looking Right, and um, and he made the case that his behavior was gradually getting worse, which is very compelling because you know this kind of this this sliding slippery slope of okay well i'm gonna cherry pick my evidence and i'm gonna oversell the evidence i'm gonna polish things up here a little bit and deceive the reviewers a little bit right it it is compelling that once you start going down that slope and i felt 
that myself. That over time, it gets it gets a bit more comfortable to do questionable things. But still, to actually change a number, um, you know, that's going very far. And it, but but the committee also found that he committed fraud in his dissertation, which would fly in the face of his his theory or his account. And um, when he was asked in a New York Times interview, he dodged the question and then I, I had an email exchange with him and he also dodged the question and got very defensive and said, oh, you can't publish this and and uh, I have to approve everything you put in your book. And and so, it, you know, it just confirmed that he... he He's got no integrity and, and, but somehow I still felt bad for him in some inexplicable way. Well, maybe because I was also kind of disgusted with the system at the time and being felt let down by professors. Anyways, um, so, so that was a big hit uh, that really shook psychology again, especially social psychology. But let's finish on a, a, on a positive note. <laughs> so now we're in the fall of 2010. And again, there was, there was now not just rumors, but there was actual information coming out about various initiatives to raise transparency standards and to encourage replication. Um, and um, this was very exciting. I mean, this is this, it, it got so exciting that we were part of this movement and that we were going to change norms for the better, but they're, we're going to change them forever. I mean, like, there's not going to be another. Well, there could, I guess there could be, but the idea is that you know, this will go down in the history of psychology textbooks as basically the pit of, pivotal moment from kind of the the darker age of psychology to a Renaissance area. So some liken it to chemistry and how there was alchemy, which was mostly just voodoo findings and, and no standards, no replication. And then eventually alchemy did turn, transform into proper chemistry. And so it was really exciting that we were not just changing norms, changing standards. We were part of a movement that was going to change psychology forever and might inspire other fields to raise their standards. So kind of a general raising of standards in academia more generally um and and so i began i mean i mean I, I was already doing that stuff i mean even in grad school i was publishing papers on methods and trying to say okay how can we increase replicability before people were even talking about replication and then talking about problems with our methods and underappreciating replication, and 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 a commentary wrote about Bem's paper, and but now there was this growing movement, and you could be public and say, "Oh, I'm part of the transparency movement. I'm part of the open science movement." Um, and so that's I think where we'll leave it off, um, because. You know, it, it was still, okay, this is a crisis, and it's still an ongoing crisis, but now it's getting dark because it's 10 years after Daryl Bem, and the improvements are negligible when you when you look at them more carefully. But, uh, but, but yeah, there's positive in the negative, and this is something I've gotten better over time at doing, is saying, okay, this is a really big crisis. 
But with a really big crisis comes a really big opportunity to improve things, come up with some simple, well, not simple, but come up with, with solutions and new standards to try to prevent things like this. Oh, and I should clarify that, that in terms of ESP, the Daryl Bam bomb, that of course it's always possible. I mean, it, it, it's possible that paranormal effects could be true, could be real. But, um, and this is why science is so exciting because you have, uh, Carl Sagan has this incredible quote, which is something like, uh, science is so exciting because you need to have simultaneously two seemingly contradictory attitudes. One is the most open mind, the most open perspective to any idea, no matter how crazy they sound, but also ruthlessly skeptical and ruthlessly scrutinize all claims and have the highest standards uh, for evidence, right? And, and that's, and so, because we were often confused or criticized for, oh, your guys are so boring. You don't believe in anything, like, you know, on the fringe. And, uh, and there's this misconception that scientists need certainty and they need certain, uh, need to be certain, but it's, it's, it's actually not true. Uh, it's actually about quantifying the uncertainty of the evidence, because even with uh, Newton's theory of gravity that was revolutionary at the time and was more or less um, believed for hundreds, I think 150 years, and it turned out to be wrong, um, so it's more about calibrating your confidence in certain beliefs and theories based on the evidence, but the evidence can always change. But of course, if a theory has been corroborated, meaning it's not been proven wrong for hundreds of years across thousands of studies uh, done correctly, <laughs> then it'll take a lot of counter evidence to dislodge uh, that belief. Um, well, no, let's not get into that. With the, the black swan effect, uh, but you would still need, it's not like one experiment is going to uh, change. So in the case of Einstein, um, it is kind of simplified and, and over romanticized a little bit that the the study where they actually measured the bending of light during a solar eclipse that proved uh, Newton wrong and Einstein right, uh, it's, it's oversimplified. It's not like they just did the one study and then it was declared. They had to do it at several spots and then they did replications across other solar eclipses. And, you know, it still took time to let go uh, and and we'll get back to this but it and I get, this is also why science is exciting because it's not as robotic as people think where oh you do studies and then you discover facts and then you take those facts and then you combine them and you come up with theory it, it's way more messy and and it's exciting because there's both rationality and irrationality where it, it actually can make sense to cling on to a theory for too long because there's always something wrong that could have happened in the studies, in the experimental tests of hypotheses. And, and even it goes even further, especially for more formal quantitative areas of science like physics. Sometimes it's not a, just a problem with the experiment, but a problem with deriving the prediction from the theory. And so there's all these examples where they did, they were doing, uh, studies with solar neutrinos um, going really, really fast and 
there was a lot on the line and the experiment didn't give the proper results and they didn't they did it several times but they still didn't give up because there was so much on the line and then they went back and realized they had calculated something wrong with the theoretical derivation so they were able to save the theory but of course you have to be careful because if you never are willing to to let go a theory well then you're not really doing science so it's a very very tricky balance between over clinging to a theory and under clinging to a theory and then how do you adjudicate experimental tests and how much evidence do you require i mean it's 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 a big mess but that's part of the fun it's it's it requires both creativity and ruthless scrutiny and meticulous carefully executed studies but all of that requires at the minimum sufficient transparency and sufficient emphasis on independent replication which in grad school we learned very quickly was not very uh, present okay uh, signing off and uh, till next time